True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Good evening. Now, murder is stupid, and tonight's case proves it better than any other. Dee Castile was 44 years old, an alcoholic, and a waitress at the International House of Pancakes in Naranja, Florida, about 35 miles south of Miami. Dee was married with three children, and she was in a troubled marriage. More than troubled. They beat each other. Dysfunctional, right? Very. So those who should have known Dee best would say that she was the nicest person you'd ever meet. But she was easily led into a plot which ended with grand theft and two murders. Now with a cast of interesting characters and incredible circumstances, the case of the IHOP murders will leave you wondering if the path to death row is lined with alcohol, stupidity, or underlying evil. What do we have for a beer today? We have a Florida beer. Now, I, I didn't go that far south into Miami. I'm, I'm more in central Florida. So I have a beer called Last Snow from Funky Buddha Brewing in Oakland Park, Florida. Now, Last Snow is an American porter. And these are beers with a pale malt base and the addition of black malt, crystal malt, brown malt, or smoked malt. There's a fair amount of variability in porters. So that some can be barrel-aged. Some can have coffee or chocolate added. The hop bitterness varies quite a bit, but they're more commonly fairly balanced between hops and malt, so they're, they're not hop bombs like an IPA. This particular wine, Last Snow, is a dark beer with a big kind of mocha-colored head. And I, I guess the best description of its taste and aroma is that it's like cold-brewed coconut mocha from Starbucks. That sounds yummy. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. So that's that's the beer. It's very smooth. It's medium-bodied. Nice beer. Okay. Well, let's open it up and go down to the quiet end. All right. All right. Let's go to the quiet end, Jilly. I got the beer and the snifters. Okay. Well, before we walk down, I just have to tell you how handsome and spiffy you look tonight. Oh, you're rocking the bow tie, huh? I love the bow tie. You know, in my younger days, I wore them all the time because kids would grab the the long tie. Because we all had to wear ties. Of course. Back in the day. Right. But if I had a tie on and the, the baby was being examined or the little kid was being examined, they'd grab it and they'd chew on it or puke on it. <laughs> all sorts of things. Yeah. So it was easy to wear a bow tie because they couldn't get their little hands on it. Now, I've kind of outgrown the bow ties over the years, but every once in a while I feel nostalgic and I'll put one on. I like the look. It just gives you that very scholarly kind of Professor Bill Nye look. Yeah, it's my professorial look. I like it. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So, Naranja, Florida is a blue-collar area of Dade County, south of downtown Miami, by about 35 miles. And it's an unremarkable place with lots of pickup trucks. Back in the 80s, when Dee Castile lived there, the only tourists were on their way to Key West or Monkey Jungle. Remember Monkey Jungle? I have to say I don't remember that. But you used to vacation down there with your family. 
Right. So did you go to Monkey Jungle when you were a kid? We did. My grandparents lived in Miami, and Monkey Jungle was my favorite place. Now, looking back, it was probably horrible that the monkeys were kept there, but I loved them, and I always wanted to have one when I grew up. A chimpanzee, probably. Oh, great. Of my very own. Yeah, that's what we need. So you're lucky I outgrew that before we got married. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> but D was working the day shift at IHOP on May 29th, 1983, when her twisted path toward ruin really got started. The company-owned Lincoln Town Car pulled into the parking lot as D carried a plate of pancakes to a customer. Now it was around 2 p.m. She'd begun work at 6 a.m., and it was a Sunday, so that's their busiest day of the week. Her arms were tired and her feet ached, and as she watched the car, she thought, it must be Alan. Now, the thought of Alan really kind of excited her and made her nervous. Does she have a little crush on Alan? I think so. She was strangely attracted to Alan. Now, that was James Alan Bryant, who was the lover of the IHOP's owner, Art Valencia. So she dashed to the ladies' room to spruce herself up. She liked to look her best when Alan was there, and the other waitresses noticed that. Now, this was surprising, not just because Alan was gay, but because Dee was 44, Alan was 25, and because Dee had always been attracted to large macho men. You know, mostly the wife beaters and the alcoholics that entered her life. Right. But here she is attracted to a, a flamboyantly gay guy. Right. Huh. Now, Alan, he had been with Art for about eight years. He was small and effeminate, and Art was a successful businessman who'd bought the IHOP specifically for Alan to manage, so kind of something to keep Alan busy and productive. Right. Make him feel useful. Yeah. Keep him out of trouble, maybe? Which it definitely didn't do. Yeah, as, as we'll find out or discuss, it certainly didn't keep him out of trouble. No, it didn't seem to. But, yeah, I can see if... if from all I've read and heard, that this was a tumultuous relationship. Very much so. Lots of breakups and getting back together and fights, physical fights. Yes. And so... A volatile relationship between these two men. Very. So I can see the idea of, well, if I have him managing an IHOP, he'll at least have a job and keep himself busy. Yeah, and he had experience in the restaurant business. So yeah. he, he was good at it when he did it. Now, Dee had only been at the IHOP for nine months. And because Alan didn't flirt with her like he did with some of the younger waitresses, she thought he didn't really like her. Now, she'd been fired from every other restaurant in town for drinking on the job. Yeah, Dee, as we'll find out and discuss more, Dee's a hardcore alcoholic. Yes. I mean, she was drinking two and three bottles of scotch a day. Scotch was her drink of choice. Can you imagine? I mean, I guess you build up the tolerance, but you just have to be in a total fog. Wouldn't you think? Even one bottle, I would think you're not going to be yeah, really she, there. I mean, this is, this is a, a really rock-bottom, hardcore drinker. It is. It's a sad story in that way, yeah. That part is, yeah. So Dee lived in fear of being fired from the IHOP, because all that day, like most days, Dee had been sipping from a glass of iced coffee laced with scotch. That's her daily routine. Right. So well, she kind of had to, to keep it going. I mean, what does that mean when when someone's an alcoholic and they really just need to keep like a hair of the dog? Right. you got to keep maintain, it going. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll start withdrawing. Shaking. And, and get shakes and, and weak and sweaty and stuff. Right, right. So she had to do that to keep level. Right. So every day she smuggled in the whiskey and kept it in an industrial-sized oregano bottle. So it was disguised. That day, Dee was sharing her whiskey with the alcoholic cook. <laughs> but he had left the bottle out where Alan could see it. So, uh-oh. So Dee comes out of the ladies' room. Alan was standing at the glass counter and taking cash from the register. As the manager of the IHOP, Alan always helped himself to cash from the register. According to Alan, his arrangement with Art was that he could take expense money from the cash drawer but would get no salary. Sure. Good story. That leaves things very open-ended. But everyone there knew, and this includes Art, the owner, that Alan was robbing him and cheating on him to boot. Yeah. He was blatant about it and joked that Art was an old fuddy-duddy. Mm-hmm. So he's almost 20 years younger. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because Art was in his mid-40s. Right. About the same age as Dee. But Alan was now in love with a handsome young man from Cuba. Art rarely came to the IHOP anymore because, when he did, he and Alan ended up arguing. They'd go upstairs to the office and everyone downstairs in the restaurant could hear them. <laughs> Very loud arguments. Yeah, really awkward. So the relationship between Art and Alan was very volatile. Several times Dee had seen Art with scratches and bruises from fights with Alan. This particular day, Alan noticed the oregano bottle and sniffed it. Dee was sure she was going to be fired. But Alan left without mentioning it. So crisis averted. For the moment. For the moment. On Tuesday, two days later, Alan called Dee at her home. He asked her to come by the IHOP and talk to him. So now she knows for sure he's going to fire her. She was so sure that she brought her waitress uniforms with her in her car to return to him. When Dee arrived at the restaurant, Alan asked her to go for a ride with him. So first surprise, she's not fired immediately. She's going to go out, drive with Alan. And that's a new thing. He'd never it's taken it's her for a ride before. Never done that. So? So I can see... You know, like you said, she's got kind of a crush on him anyway. Yes. Right? Right. And he says, let's go for a ride. Yep. Must have gotten her going. I think it did. Of course, she'd had a few drinks before she came because she was nervous about getting fired. Right. And I think she'd brought the scotch with her. But she'd have a few drinks anyway. Of course. But maybe she had more just because she was fearful of being fired. A little bit more, yeah. Well, as Alan drove the Lincoln on the South Dixie Highway with Dee in the passenger seat, he told her that he knew the whiskey was in the oregano bottle and that it was hers, and Dee admitted to him that it was. But Alan told her not to worry. People like them needed to stick together, he said, and he wouldn't tell on her to Art. Big relief. Yeah. Now, Alan, he bitched about Art and how he needed to get free of him. He was talking to Dee like a friend, and she was really flattered by this. After driving for about a half an hour or so, he got to his point. He said, it sounds crazy, but somebody told me you know a guy who could take a contract. Now, Dee kind of giggled. He must have been talking about her husband's friend, Mike, she thought. Mike worked at the local Amico station, and he liked to kid with Dee that he could take care of her husband, Cass, for her if he was giving her trouble. Yeah, but it was kind of bullshit stuff, you know? Yeah, it was a running joke between yeah. the two of them. Yeah, you, know, you want to be with me, I'll take care of him. Right. That type of stuff. Nothing serious. At not, least she didn't think so. Not that I'd take it that way. Right. Now, Dee told Alan that he must have been talking about Mike, but Mike was sweet and gentle, she thought. He was just a kidder, and Mike was definitely no hitman. But and that made Dee feel kind of sad, like she'd let him down. So she said, Mike might know someone who would, just to try and get back in his good graces. And that's how it all began. Dee and Alan went for this ride, and the plot to kill... Art Venencia was born. Yeah, see? She's an alcoholic, so that clouds her judgment anyway. Yes. She probably or definitely has low self-esteem. Mm-hmm. And she kind of likes this guy. So he's he starts talking about, is there something we can do because I want to get rid of my boyfriend? And she's going to try to oblige him. Right. Or, or at least talk about obliging him because she wants to, number one, keep her job. And number two, she wants to stay on the good side of Alan. Exactly. Now, she was expected in her life to make more of herself than a waitress. She'd had a rocky start in life, but she grew up to be quite bright and capable. She was born back in 1938 in Tampa. Now, during the, her mother's pregnancy with Dee, Dee's mother married her father so that Dee would be legitimate. And the marriage lasted only one year. Dee's mother an alcoholic as well, and suffering from tuberculosis, was sent to a sanitarium when Dee was just a toddler. Then Dee went to live with her maternal grandmother. Now Dee would call her grandmother Mama. And Mama was good to Dee, playing with her, buying her dolls, and dressing her in pretty dresses. And Dee would remember fondly how Mama brushed her hair and tied it with ribbons. So this was kind of an idealized part of her life that she held with her through adulthood. Right. And that's also a story told retrospectively. You know, well, yes, of who, course. Who knows how great it was. It was probably better than home life with mom. Right. Yeah, and, and other situations later in her life, of course. Absolutely. Now, she stayed with mama until she was eight, 
and then her father returned for her. He'd remarried, and he and his wife wanted to raise her as their daughter. So Dee's father, he had a pretty short fuse, and he um he yelled a lot, but he wasn't physically abusive. He taught Dee how to bowl, and she would eventually become one of the top women bowlers in Florida. She was a pretty girl, and she got good grades in high school. She was a cheerleader, and she sang in the glee club. On her 17th birthday, her father and stepmother bought her a car, even though they had to get a loan and go into debt to do it. Now, throughout her teens, Dee began to drink alcohol, and this would lead to be probably her downfall in life would be the alcohol. The alcohol took control of her. Yes. Now, she liked the way alcohol made her feel, and unlike her other friends in high school, she didn't get sick when she drank too much. She didn't have any vomiting or hangovers that might have curbed her drinking. Who knows? Now, when Dee was 17, she got pregnant, too. And her parents and her boyfriend, Harry's parents, decided that the two would get married. Because this is, what, the 1950s? Yeah, she's born in 38. Yeah. So it's uh, mid-50s. Mid right. Yeah. So you got to get married. You get married. Right. Otherwise, you go to some home for unwed mothers and give the baby up. Right, exactly. So Harry and Dee had some blood tests and got a marriage license. On the day of the ceremony, Dee drove to Harry's house to pick him up. There's a friend of Harry's standing there, outside the house. Harry's not going, he told Dee. So Dee's father and stepmother ended up raising Dee's son as their own. Dee was happy to have her freedom back. She took courses to complete high school and to learn secretarial skills. When she graduated, she went right to work for the city of Hialeah. Now, the mayor uh, at that time, Henry Melander, liked Dee. And, and this is a one of these old-time political bosses. He had his <laughs> finger into everything. Yeah, yeah. Like from the old movies, it sounds like. Right. So at age 18, Dee was a very pretty young woman. Melander was like the wealthy, influential father she never had. He was her mentor. He introduced her to millionaires, heads of industry, and local politicians. Uh-huh. Dee dated men who were 10 to 15 years older than her, men with yachts and suites at the F Fontainebleau fancy hotel. Yes. These were rich men who bought Dee expensive gifts and took her out to fancy restaurants and clubs. During this time, Dee established a pattern of continuing to date only men who got drunk with her. If she went on a date that didn't revolve around drinking, Dee would conclude that the man was boring and she would avoid him. So she's already setting her standards. Which aren't good. This... It's not going to lead to any place good. No. When Dee did get drunk with a date, the date would very likely get lucky. Yes. So alcohol made her sexually uninhibited. She was careless, so it was not a surprise when she got pregnant again. This father was a rich, handsome 30-year-old man who had recently been voted the most eligible bachelor in Miami. So fat chance that he's going to marry her. Yeah, but I kind of feel like she sold herself short not to go to him and at least try. Like she thought he was, she wasn't in his class and she didn't even really try. Well, I know that. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying. Who knows? Maybe he really liked her. Right. Well, he liked her enough to have sex with her. So she had gotten drunk with him on the first date never occurred to Dee to ask the man to marry her. She felt that she wasn't in his class, so she just asked him for the money to pay for an abortion. Right, so I really think she sold herself short there. But well, then, you could say she was being realistic. I guess, but she's young with her life ahead of her. I say shoot for the stars. Don't sell yourself short. Well, yeah. Plus, hold him responsible. Again, we're back in the 50s. Well, I don't know. I don't think that she really gave herself enough credit there. No, obviously. No. But anyway, she couldn't locate the father, so she went to um, Henry Melander for help, and he gave her the $500 for the abortion. Now, after that, she got a job as an executive secretary to the Hialeah branch manager of Florida Power and Light. So this was a pretty impressive position for a 20-year-old. Yeah. And she's got a good job. Yeah. Making money. Yep. But drinking. Yeah, well, yes, that's the problem. But the general consensus was that Dee could make something special of herself if she could just stop getting pregnant. That's what her father thought at that point. But after rumors of drunkenness, 
And after they found out about Dee's fairly late-term abortion that she had, the Florida Power and Light Company fired Dee. So for a while, Dee was a professional bowler, too. She bowled in five leagues per week, and she was elected to the Women's International Bowling Conference. But the big companies who sponsored bowling tournaments wanted people of high moral character to support the image of bowling as a wholesome family activity. Now, when they inquired with people into Dee's life, they heard that Dee was a drinker, and this ended her bowling career. So I think a lot of this stuff is very prejudicial and sexist. Well, yes. Sure, she drank, but really? You're going to yeah. look into someone like that? I don't know. Well, they want a squeaky clean representative. I guess, but it's not like she was out, you know, molesting children or something. She drank, so... She drank. She slept with a bunch of people. Right, which is her right to do. I know. Yeah. But, again, this this is 50 years ago. Things Things were looked at differently. That's definitely a factor. You're right. Now, when she was 23, she met her first husband, um, well, her first real husband. She was married to Harry for a little while, but not really. It was a technicality. Yeah, they ended up getting married. Yeah, but they never lived together. Right. So this was her first real husband, and his name was Lester. Now, Lester was the kind of guy that Dee would usually go for. He was big, he was tall and muscular, and they met in a bar. They went hunting and camping together. And Les was somewhat health conscious, but he also drank heavily two or three times a month. And when he did, he would become drunk, abusive, and violent. So Les, he made a good living in real estate, and Dee worked at the Sweet Paper Company. But she had internal damage from her abortion, and she had to go have that surgically corrected so she could have children. Now in 1966, when Dee was 28, her daughter Susan was born. And Dee quit her job and stayed at home with Susan. And she actually went for a whole year without drinking at this point in her life. But Les began to drink more, and he was physically abusive. And then Dee began sneaking some drinks at home, which led into heavy drinking again. So, when Les ended up holding a gun to Dee, she did leave him. And she called Henry Melander again, who got her a new job. So now she had a job as a police dispatcher for the city of Hialeah. And she really excelled at her job, and she ended up taking a higher-paying dispatcher job with the Dade County Police in Miami. So again, she's got things going for her. She does. Right? She's definitely yeah. bright. Yeah, nobody questions that. I mean, everything I've, I've read about her, she was a smart woman. Yes. Very intelligent. Right. Maybe not a lot of common sense, but a well, lot of things go into that. That's true. And and there's the alcohol. I mean, that just fucks you up. Sure. So Dee met her third husband, if you count Harry for his brief <laughs> marriage to her. But right. Third husband, Charlie White, at a party. So she follows her familiar pattern. She got drunk with him on the first night and slept with him. He was just her type, an alcoholic. But Charlie made a good living installing air conditioning. The two became drinking buddies. Dee applied for her training as a Miami police officer. So she's going to move up some more, going from dispatch to becoming an actual officer. Right. And that's something she wanted to do. Yeah. So she was at the top of her class halfway through the first six-week training program when she went in for her review. So investigations into Dee's life led to the conclusion that she was an alcoholic, and she ended up being expelled from the, pro the program. Now there's a blow. There is a blow, and she must have gotten into some kind of trouble or something, because it's not people saying you're drinking is not enough for them to kick you out. She must have had some behaviors related well, to the drinking. She must have. And yeah. There, there must have been public displays of behavior. Exactly. There'd have to be, I would think. Yeah. So I guess they found people that said she was drunk and belligerent. Right. She did this and that. Yeah. yeah. So after being expelled from the police officer program, she went to work with the Miller Gas Company. And here she was, again, an excellent worker, and there's a period of stability in her life. Then Charlie got kidney disease, and he was out of work for a year. And during this time, Dee started borrowing from the Miller Gas Company. 
in her position, D accepted gas bill payments, and many were paid with cash. Right, which is, you can see the trouble coming. Can't you? It's just, yeah. just written all over there. Yeah, yeah. So D would enter these payments into ledgers, which would periodically be entered into the computer. Miller gas customers were divided into zones, with each zone having a different billing period. So many people ended up paying their bills weeks before the due date, and D was left with a good amount of cash from each zone that didn't have to be accounted for until the next billing period in that zone. So she began by borrowing $50 to pay a medical bill. By the time the money had to be accounted for, she was still broke, so she borrowed $100 from another zone. So you can see where this is heading, right? Yes, definitely. Paid the 50 she owed, kept 50 to pay other personal expenses. By this time, Dee and Charlie had two boys, Wyatt and Todd, supporting three children on her salary because Charlie's not working due to his kidney disease. Right. But she wasn't able to make ends meet. No. She never considered what she was doing to be stealing. She was borrowing. And that's a good way to think of it in your mind. Well... That I'm not actually stealing. I'm just borrowing this and I'm going to pay him back. Well, we're going to find out that this decast deal was really good at making these justifications. She was never really doing what she was doing. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But at least in this case, each time the money came due, she didn't have it. So the cycle continued. Right. Which would happen. Yeah. Now, she did get away with it for about a year. And she ended up running up a tab of $14,000. Now, the way she got caught was she let a $1,000 check she'd written go through and it bounced, which caused them to do an audit, and then they fired her. So, so if only that check hadn't bounced, she could have continued. Well, but who knows for how much longer. Oh, it wouldn't be very It's a losing longer, game. Because she was taking more and more money. Right. You can never catch up in that kind of thing. No. It's like... Other things we've talked about, a big Ponzi scheme. Right. Except this time it involves replacing money. Yes. But, you know, she didn't have anyone to borrow money from personally, so I could see the position she was in. Well, and nobody would loan her money anyway. No. Nobody was likely to loan her money. No, probably not. So she lost her job, and this scam really hurt her future, so it was more than just the lost job. It was kind of a lost career because now other businesses weren't going to hire her no and give her that kind of responsibility. No one's going to hire her. Yeah. So she couldn't get a job in the white-collar market, and she began working waitressing and bartending jobs. And working as a bartender at the Saga Lounge in Cutler Ridge, Dee was around alcohol all day, so you can imagine that was bad. Through the mid-'70s, alcohol really took over her life. And Dee and Charlie divorced, but Dee, she was kind of kind-hearted from what you can tell in many ways, although in other ways not not at all, <laughs> but she did seem to have a kind heart back then, right? Right. And she felt sorry for Charlie, and she let him continue to live with her and the kids because he's he needed a place to stay. Right, and he's got kidney disease. He's probably dying. Yeah, I don't know about that, but he wasn't. Completely functional, at least. No. But now, while working at the Saga Lounge, Dee meets her next husband, Cass. And Cass is another alcoholic and another physically abusive man. Just her type. Yep. Well, I guess Charlie never beat her, right? Mm, yeah, he did, I think. He was violent, yep. He was, too. Yep. All right, so the pattern continues. Yes. So the first, the first victim of Dee's crimes and the crimes of the other people in this story was Art Venencia. And Art was a private man. He had many friends in South Florida. He was involved in the South Florida Theater Organ Society. And these friends would say that Art was helpful, intelligent, well-mannered, and very talented. He'd been a quiet child, and he'd spent summers with his great aunts in North Carolina, he ended up attending the University of Miami in Coral Gables, where he got a degree in um, electrical engineering. Now, he played piano in cocktail lounges and gay bars when he graduated college. His homosexuality remained for the most part private, and he spent his younger years in the closet. 
but there was some conflict between Art and his mother, Bessie, over his homosexuality, and also she didn't like that he wasn't working in the engineering field. He'd gotten that degree, but he was working in other things, right? He was playing the piano, stuff like that. Oh, he wasn't doing the stuff that he had gotten his degree in. Right. She didn't like that. Disappointment to mom. Right. But he did get into real estate, and he invested in residential property, and he did very well. And he ended up buying a beautiful home in Coconut Grove. So back in 1975, when Art was 33, he met this slim, effeminate, 18-year-old man named James Allen Bryant. Now the two men got together, and Art invited Allen to move in with him pretty soon in the relationship. Allen was taking pills, and Art kind of saw him as a... Um, a project as well as a partner. Right. Alan's parents had divorced when he was young, and he and his two older sisters were raised by a variety of relatives. His uncle owned a small restaurant, and this is where Alan worked, and he developed his abilities in the restaurant business. So this pairing of Art and Alan, it made Art less sociable. He wasn't intimate with many people, but he wasn't a hermit either and he was very involved with that organ society. He had this love of instruments, and the society was dedicated to preserving theater organs. So you know those big organs with the pipes that they used to have in the... They used to have them for the the films that had no sound. Right. What they call those? Silent, Silent films. films. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good name for them. Yeah, but they they had the organs. Right. And a lot of big churches had them too. Right, exactly. So they would spend long evenings and weekends stripping, varnishing, and replacing pipes, stuff like that, hands-on work. Right. Now, Alan didn't do that and, at all. And Alan wasn't into that. No, not at all. But Art was. Art, it was kind Art of a passion it. for him. It was, and he had a lot of friends in that. Yeah. from that. It was in 1981 that Art had grown tired of his house in Coconut Grove and the high taxes on it, and he bought some property in the Redlands to have a house built for him and Alan to live in. So they had a house in the country, and Art raised orchids. Alan was restless, and that's when Art bought the IHOP for him to manage. No one would contradict that Alan was selfish and demanding with Art at all. Alan's acquaintances, even those who were really very fond of him and liked him a lot, agreed that he was a pathological liar. A few days after Alan took Dee for that ride in the Lincoln, Dee drove to the Amico station on Route 1 in Homestead, and this is where Mike Irvine worked, as a mechanic. Now, Alan had asked Dee to find out if Mike would really do a murder or if he knew somebody who would take that job. And he had also asked her to get a price. <laughs> so Mike wasn't there the first night, and Dee went back the next night. So I don't really understand what Dee's thinking. But... I don't either. Any insight I mean, into this? This this is just the, the road to ruin, basically. Right. And, and I guess the, the best you could do is say that she was under the influence of alcohol constantly. Well, sure. And, and she was halfway in love with this guy and wanted to do what she could to make him happy. Well, it seems like that's at the heart of it is pleasing him. Yeah. But it seems like you'd get to a point and you'd say, well, hell no, I'm not going to do that. Well. But she didn't. You would think that when it comes to the point of trying to arrange a murder, You'd back off. Right. And, and she goes there the first night, Mike's not there, and she comes back the next night. So it's not like she was just drunk and did it on a whim because she did it again. Yeah. So she pulls into the gas station around midnight that night, and she didn't get to talk to Mike until 3 a.m. So she's up all night. She's waiting for him. It's really weird. And then he was alone, and he came over to see her, and he seemed all happy to see her. So I think maybe Mike had a bit of a crush on D. What do you he, think? He could have. Seemed like it. You know? I mean, he was always joking about uh, killing her husband for her. Right. And you know? maybe she was trying to impress Alan and Mike was trying to impress D. I don't yeah. know. I, I think he was trying to impress D with his thoughts or his statement that he'd take care of her husband, which right. to me means that he'd take the husband's place. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think so. But then he takes it another a step or two further saying that he knows somebody who'll kill somebody else. Right. I mean, Dee ended up joking with Mike for several minutes while he filled her gas tank. This is after she's waited for three hours. Yeah. 
So yeah. anyway. Drinking scotch, I bet, the whole time. Oh, probably sitting in her car and drinking. Dee told Mike that she knew someone who wanted somebody killed. Mike said that he wasn't a killer. Big surprise. But he had a friend who would do it. She asked about the price. So Mike said the price would depend on who the target was. So basically, if it's somebody more famous, the cost would be higher. As if he you know, killed famous people. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's talking from Starsky and Hutch shows or whatever was on at the time. Gave him these ideas. Before Dee left, Mike surprised her by saying, and this, see, he, he's not so bad in no. terms of being un- unobservant. Before she left, he says to her, Mike says to her, I bet that's that queer bastard you work for, and he probably wants his lover knocked off. Huh. True words, huh? So there were signs already. So Dee knew he was right. Alan wanted to kill Art so he could be with his young lover. Mike said he would need a photo and his habits and schedule. Now, despite his talk, Mike had no experience as a murderer. And it's a bit unclear if he was trying to show off with Dee or what else. Everyone who knew Mike thought of him as a kind man. His only experiences in crime had to do with drug selling and petty theft. So he was a minor player in the drug scene. Yeah. And he'd steal and fence things, but nothing major. No. I mean, he had a job and he was kind to most people. Yeah. So by all accounts, Mike was an easygoing guy, very calm. But like Dee, he was the type who couldn't say no. So whenever somebody asked him for a favor, he would do it. It is tempting to think that Mike was harmless, but he obviously wasn't. Exactly. As we'll see. With many of the characters in this crime, there were a lot of people I felt like, well, yeah, that's a nice person, but then the things they do, they they can't be nice people. Not with what they did. Exactly. The day after her meeting with Mike, Dee told Alan about their conversation. They're back at the IHOP. Alan was pleased with Dee's story and patted her shoulder and kissed her cheek. He ran upstairs to the office and returned with Art Venetia's passport photo. So Dee brought the photo to Mike at the gas station. He told her that they would need half the money in advance. Dee said, no problem. Like, she's really (laughs) into this, you know. Right. She's the middleman. At a third meeting at the gas station, Dee gave Mike Art's address and told him that Art owned two cars, the Lincoln Town Car and a 1980 Plymouth pickup. Art usually drove the pickup. He was usually drunk by 11 o'clock, so that might be a good time to murder him, because he'll be passed out. Right. So when you get to the point where you're bringing money and a photo, you know it's serious. Time to put on the brakes. Well, yeah. That's more than just talking about it. Although, you could also think that they're going to back out and just rip off the money. Well, maybe, maybe, but... Maybe they're still not serious. I don't know what she's thinking. No, I don't either. Now, Dee had never seen Art drunk, but I guess Art used to drink at night before he went to sleep. That's what Alan said. Yeah, this is all second-hand knowledge about Art's drinking well, uh, habits. Alan was just playing her like, what's the phrase, like a fiddle? Playing her like a fiddle. Yeah. Right? Now, Mike Irvine said he would pass the information Dee had given him to his friend, and the next morning... Mike strolls into the IHOP with this big grin on his face. He slips into one of Dee's booths, winks at her, and orders a cup of coffee. Then he flips over a napkin to show Dee where he'd written $1,250. So this was going to be the price of the murder. That's the down payment? I think that's the whole price at this point. he wanted half up front and half when it was done. That, I think that's the next time because, you know, they make a couple attempts here. Oh, yeah. Right? So they're going to murder somebody for a little over $1,000. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, it is the 70s, but still, it's not a ton of money. No. So after Mike left the IHOP that morning, Dee told Alan the price, and Alan was pleased with it. He told Dee to go ahead and tell Mike that it's all a go. Go ahead with the murder, sure. So Dee made another late-night trip to the Amico station to tell Mike that Alan would pay, and she asked when the murder would happen. Mike said that they would decide, but not until after they got the money. So a couple of days go by before Alan shows up at the IHOP again and says to Dee, let's go for a ride. So Dee, of course, 
is happy that Alan wants to take her for a ride and spend time with her. So, oh, sure, she goes with him. <laughs> She's not thinking other than, oh, good, I get to go for a ride with my boyfriend. Yeah, kind my, of like a... My boyfriend that I want to be, my boyfriend. Yeah, it's kind of like a golden retriever. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. we're going for a ride. <laughs> So Alan drove with Dee to Fort Lauderdale, and when, he, when she asked where they're going, Alan told her that they're going to buy a gun. I've been thinking, Alan said, why should we pay your friend all that money? We can do it ourselves. Besides, that way, there'll be fewer people who know about it. You know, forget the fact that they've already spoken about it with these guys. Right. But that's what he says. So who's going to do the killing, Alan? Well, Dee says we, and Alan says I'll do it, but I need you to go with me. So one reason Alan wanted D was that she had some knowledge of firearms. So it had been like 15 years since she'd handled a gun, but she did know how to fire one. So D consumed scotch from her purse on the drive. At the gun shop, Alan acted as if buying a gun was all D's idea, and he was just along for the ride. And they ended up picking out a 32 caliber pistol, a small holster, and some ammunition. Now, when the clerk asked for an ID, though, Alan searched his pants pockets. Damn, I forgot my wallet, he said. We'll have to come back. So this is clearly a ploy. Clearly. Because they get to the parking lot and Alan turns to Dee and says, This is silly. Why should we come back? You can buy the gun. Huh, huh. Right. Though Alan uh, apparently forgot his wallet, he did have the cash for the gun. So he just didn't want to show his ID. Clearly. He gave the cash to Dee, who was more than happy to help. <laughs> the hell? What's going on? Right. So the gun was purchased in her name. Late that night, Alan called Dee and convinced her to come out and practice shooting. Dee told her husband, Cass, that she was going to work the night shift at IHOP and went to meet Alan. So that night, Alan talked about the young man he was in love with like a schoolgirl. He bought a bottle of vodka for him and a bottle of scotch for Dee. They drove drinking through the side roads in the Florida Keys and fired the pistol out the window. They took turns shooting at trees and road signs. This is just beyond belief. Now drunk, Alan said that he was ready to kill Art, and Dee agreed. They went to the house in the Redlands. Yeah, now before we get more into it, let's talk about our new sponsor, Casper Mattresses. Okay. Now, before we got our Casper mattress, I thought we had a pretty good mattress. I mean, at least it was better than the mattress we sleep on when we visit the kids in California. Well, of course, that's a bed that an 11-year-old sleeps in. True, but our new Casper mattress is just lovely. Not too soft, not too firm. It's just right. Now I sound like Goldilocks. You take over. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> our Casper is a superior mattress. Absolutely. I wake up refreshed and ready to go. You know, Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. The supportive memory foam creates an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and bounce. Try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially considering you're going to spend a third of your life on it. Casper offers free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada. With over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars, it's quickly becoming the Internet's favorite mattress. Get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com forward slash brewery and using offer code brewery, B-R-E-W-E-R-Y. Terms and conditions apply. And speaking of a good night's sleep, you know what else has helped us sleep better at night? Simply Safe Home Security System. Getting a good night's sleep is easier said than done, especially if you think you heard a noise downstairs. Now, our dogs are wonderful creatures, but quite elderly and probably deaf. Not too much help in the security department. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> but just think about it. What do you do in that situation? Turn on all the lights, keep watch, check on your kids every hour, sleep with one eye open? Not likely. Or you can rest easy, knowing that your home and family are protected with Simply Safe. When you install your Simply Safe home security system, you're arming your home with powerful sensors that actually tell you if a door opens or a window breaks. With Simply Safe, there's a 105 decibel siren that alerts you to the first sign of trouble and a dedicated team of security professionals watching over you 24 7, ready to send the police. With Simply Safe, there are no long term contracts. 
and around-the-clock monitoring is only 15 bucks a month. So don't spend another night second-guessing your home's safety. Get Simply Safe and get some rest. Go to simplysafe.com slash listen and get a special 10% discount when you order today. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash listen, L-I-S-T-E-N, for 10% off your order. simplysafe.com forward slash listen. Now, Alan, they're at the house and he goes in and leaves Dee outside. And Dee, really drunk, passes out on a slab of concrete beside the house. Now, I would just say you have to be pretty drunk to pass out on a concrete slab. Yes, I think she was. Yeah. Yeah. When she woke up, Alan came out of the house and he says to her, Come on, forget it. We're not going to do it. We'll let your friend take care of it. So he hadn't done the murder. So he chicken out or what? We don't know. Art was home? Yes, he was home. But they didn't kill him. They didn't kill him. So a couple of days later, Alan gave Dee half of the money, and she delivered it to Mike in the middle of the night. Now, according to Dee, in her, in, in her interactions with Mike, she felt like there was an underlying sense that the murder would never happen. Mike would wink at her, and his tone of voice said to her, We're not going to murder anybody. But maybe Dee didn't really believe there would be a murder. She was under the influence of alcohol, of course, and she was probably in some kind of denial. But the reality was that she was plotting a murder. She had a pretty big role in it. She certainly did. She arranged the whole thing. Yeah. Now, Mike Irvine scheduled Art's murder as if it was an oil change or a brake repair. He called Dee to tell her that the murder would be done on the weekend of June 11th and 12th. So that was coming right up. And that weekend, Alan made arrangements to be away. So Dee went ahead and drank herself into unconsciousness. And nothing's really going to happen, she told herself. Now, on Sunday morning, Dee scanned the Miami Herald to see if there'd been any murders in the Redlands, and there hadn't been. Monday morning, she went to work, and she would stiffen each time the phone rang, because she's waiting tables, she's sipping her iced coffee with scotch, and then every time the phone rings, she thinks, oh God, am I going to find out that they killed Art? But then Art came into work on the books that day. So Art smiles cheerfully at Dee, oblivious, and goes up to his office to work. And then a little afternoon, Alan calls, and he says to Dee, did they do it? So Dee tells him no, and that Art was actually at the, at the IHOP. So Alan expressed disappointment, and a short time later it was revealed that Alan had stolen all of the restaurant's deposit money. Checks were bouncing for the expenses, and Art was furious. But this wasn't the first time that Alan had stolen from Art. Once, Alan had even taken Art's car, sold it, and then called the police and reported it stolen. <laughs> so there's a pattern here. Yes. So Alan comes into the restaurant, and he and Art are arguing loudly upstairs. At 9 p.m., Art called Dee at home, and he asked her if Alan had given her $1,600 to pay for her divorce. So Dee has no idea what he's talking about. Alan apparently had told Art that he gave Dee $1,600 of the money he'd stolen. Now, Alan was hospitalized because Art told Dee that Alan had tried to kill him and kill himself. Earlier that evening, paramedics had been called to Art's house. Art was on the road waiting in great distress. He had red marks on his neck and said Alan had tried to kill him. And Alan had locked himself in the house. Paramedics were able to talk Alan out of the house and take him to the hospital. The really sad part was how worried Art was for Alan. D too felt sorry for Alan. That night, Art confided to another waitress that he was afraid of Alan. He fired Alan and said he should no longer be allowed in the IHOP. Right, so when Art told D that Alan was out as manager, this meant that she might no longer be able to drink on the job. Since their plotting had began, Dee had been moved to the day shift, which was a preferred shift, and she was free to drink on the job as long as she was discreet about it. Now, Art told Dee that Alan had been taken to Coral Reef Hospital, where they pumped his stomach, and then he was transferred to Community Health Institute. So Dee drove to the Amico station, where she told Mike Irvine that the murder was off. So Mike says just as well that Alan is a fucking loony. 
And he, then he told Dee that he and his friend had gone out to do the murder, but his friend had gotten scared and wanted to put it off. So driving home from the gas station, Dee felt relieved, like that was the end of it. Yeah, should have been. Right. I mean, the, the hit men get cold feet, and Alan's no longer working at the job. Right. So maybe we're done. Well, that would have been good. But the next morning, Alan calls Dee from a local motel, and he asked her to bring toiletries and vodka for him. So despite everything, she's really happy to hear from him, and she does just as he asks. Yeah, instead of saying no. Right. And hanging up. Which would have been the smart thing to do. But anyway, so she goes to the hotel. Alan's there. He's frantic. Dee told him that the murder had been called off. How could you do this to me, he asked. <laughs> Dee said she had talked to Art and that Art and Alan were broken up. You're free, she said. Now and you and your boyfriend can live together. Alan says, on what? <laughs> he told Dee that she had no right to cancel the murder. Well, what's the difference, Dee said. It's over, isn't it? But Alan insisted that nothing had changed. Alan charmed Dee as he drank with her and complained about his life with Art. He said that the murder should go forward as soon as possible. So he's sweet-talking her again. He's good at it. Dee and Alan, both slightly drunk, called Mike Irvine from a payphone. Dee dialed the number and handed the phone over to Alan. Alan agreed to pay $5,000 to have Art murdered right away. Yeah, you have to pay extra for the express package. That's right. You get the deal if we do it on our schedule, but if you want it quicker, <laughs> right. the price goes up. Oh, of course. Mike said that he would have to talk to his friend. He told Alan to call him back at 3 in the morning. So Dee and Alan drank and shared secrets in the motel room for hours. We returned to the payphone. Mike had talked to his friend, and they agreed to the $5,000 price. But Mike said they would have to wait until the following weekend. In addition, Alan had to go with them. Alan hesitated, but he finally agreed. Now, just as incredible as all this goings on, Art forgave Alan the next day. <laughs> which was kind of predictable, because they've done this before. They fight, they break up, they get back together. That's true. That's yeah. their pattern. Maybe it didn't or hadn't escalated as much as this one. Yeah, that was a big but, one. But the pattern's the same. Yeah. So Art rehired him, reinstated him as the IHOP manager, welcomed him home, and gave him back the Lincoln Town Car. Wow, that Alan had some powers over people, didn't he? He sure did. He was a charmer. The man Mike had hired as his accomplice was a guy named Bill Rhodes. He was, to some people, a really scary guy. He was 34 years old. He was short, very muscular. He kept a razor knife in his pocket. I think you got to be careful of those guys. Absolutely. He worked part-time with Mike at the gas station. He'd been in the Air Force for four years, and he had done time in prison for breaking into a bar and stealing cash and alcohol. Yeah, but I mean, he's not like a serial killer or anything. No, he's just kind of a thug. Right. I and mean, after he got out of prison for the bar burglary, he kind of drifted from state to state, and he ended up in Dade County, where he was known as a kind man, but someone who probably had some trouble in his past. So now on June 15th, a Wednesday, Alan gave Dee an envelope containing $2,500 for the down payment. And when Dee gave the money to Mike, he reminded her that Alan was expected to go on the hit with them. Dee would claim that she thought Mike was probably planning to rip off Alan, so that kind of matches what you were saying. That maybe she was just thought they were going to rip off some money from him. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, this is all told in hindsight, so if it makes you sound better, you can say, well, I didn't know they were really going to murder him. I just thought they were going to steal his money. Right. Yeah, so if they were planning to rip off Alan and not kill Art, that really wouldn't make much sense anyway, I don't think. Because Dee was pretty much in love with Alan. And why would she allow Alan to be robbed and beaten? What point would there be to that? There wouldn't be. And this would also threaten her job and her drinking on the job situation, which seemed to be big priorities for her. Those are paramount. She needs the job. She's burned through most oh. of the waitressing jobs on this strip. Yes. And uh, she needs to keep drinking. 
That's right. And if she gets a job farther away, she's going to end up with DUIs. Yeah. So she does recognize that. So on Thursday, June 16th, Mike called D late at night, and he said that he and his friend would be at the IHOP between 11.30 and midnight Saturday. So Saturday night, D goes into the IHOP to wait with Alan for them. Why? Because she's his friend, I guess. She's providing backup. Yeah. Okay. So D and Alan, they sit and they smoke in a section of the IHOP that's reserved for employees. And then Mike walks in at 11.45 p.m. D watched as Alan got into the back seat of Mike's car. So that would indicate that Bill was probably in the passenger seat. Now, whatever Dee had believed up to this point, she'd later admit that while she sat at the IHOP that night, she was certain that they were going to kill Art Venencia. She even thought of calling the police at that point. But then she thought, well, what am I going to say? Well, I could think of a lot of things she could say. Yeah, for sure. But But she didn't. She didn't do anything. She didn't call the police. And then 40 minutes later, Mike's car returned and Alan walked into the restaurant. So there's no blood on him, so that was good. But then he turns to Dee and he says, it's over, they really did it. So Art Venencia, he had been in bed, and he heard a car driving up to his house, and a strange man had entered his room. Now Art had tried to run away, but his feet became tangled in his bedding. So he's trying to fight this person off, and his throat was slashed with a razor. So he died bleeding in his own bedroom pretty gruesome death. It was. Now, D. she arrived at the IHOP for her shift at 6 a.m. that Sunday, the next morning, and she'd only been there for minutes when Alan came down from the office, so it looked like he'd spend the night, he'd spent the night there. And he told D. that he wanted her to go to the house with him. We have to clean that place up, he said. It's a horrible mess. So it was a busy day at the restaurant. It was Father's Day, and Dee couldn't go with Alan until the afternoon. So Alan told Dee on the drive over that Bill had cut Art's throat while Mike held his arms down. So both men had been in on it. According to his story. Yes. And that would mean that Alan was in the house with them. So I think that Art probably knew that his lover Alan was in on killing him. Yeah, probably the... The final thing going through his brain as his throat's being slashed is that Alan did this. Right, exactly. So, so Art's body was sprawled across the bedroom floor when they got there. He was wearing pajama pants and the floor was covered in blood. So, unable to make a permanent decision about what to do with Art's body, Alan and Dee put him in a wooden wardrobe in the garage. The garage was air-conditioned and they set the thermostat all the way down. Then they put the bloody sheets, towels, and bedspread. They just pushed it all in the wardrobe with Art's body. Yeah, things are getting gross here. Well, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not disposing of the body or anything. It's going to sit in this garage. Right. Air-conditioned, but still. Yeah, but just going in there and cleaning up something like that is horrific. Isn't it? Yeah. And they're just going about their business. Well, that's what makes me think oh, that God. these people are evil. There's something wrong. It's more than being an alcoholic. There's something wrong. Yeah. Plenty of people are alcoholics and aren't like that at all. Right? Right. So while they're cleaning up, Dee found out that Art's mother, whose name was Bessie Fisher, was living in a trailer in front of the house. So she was right there when this murder occurred. Yeah, and that kind of freaked Dee out. But yeah. she didn't know about that. She had no idea. But uh, you're right, it did shock her and freak her out. Alan said that he was going to tell Mrs. Fisher that Art had gone to North Carolina on business. She was practically senile, he said, and wouldn't remember if Art had said goodbye. So Deeb is becoming hysterical. No kidding. <laughs> Alan said he'd take care of it. You'll have to get hold of Mike, he told Dee. Well, for what? Well, isn't it obvious? Alan said Mrs. Fisher will have to be killed, too. So that's a fine how do you do. Yeah. So we got the guy, the, the lover killed. Now right. we got to kill his mother. Right. Because she lived there. Well, this is Dee's version. True. So we're not sure if that's the way it happened. So Dee swore that she would have no part in killing an old lady. She said that they had to let her live. 
and she would bring meals to Mrs. Fisher from the IHOP and take care of her. So this is how the, this next pattern of things began. Right. She'd, they had kind of an agreement. She'd bring meals to her a couple times a day. Right. And got to be kind of friendly with her. Yeah, I think so. She'd go to her trailer and um, bring her her food, and she went over that day and introduced herself and told her that she was going to be bringing her meals while Art and Alan were away in North Carolina, she said. So Alan, he went ahead and disconnected Bessie's telephone and deadbolted the door to Art's house so, so Bessie couldn't go in. Now he gathered the IHOP employees together and told them that Art had gone to North Carolina on business and would be gone for an extended time. Dee was made assistant manager, and she would handle the day-to-day -day operations of the restaurant. Art owned property in North Carolina, and he didn't spend much time at the IHOP, so the employees believed Alan, and they all liked Alan and considered him to be a friend of theirs. So Dee and Alan decided that they needed to move Art's body to the metal barn in the front of the property because Bessie would have access to the garage where they'd put him. So, so Well, yeah, I can see that. And if, if they move the body, it'd be hidden. More hidden, I guess. Or more hidden. I mean, the, the mother could still be wandering around the property. Sure. Well, but I, I think I, the metal barn was further away. Yeah. yeah. I get the impression that she wasn't that mobile. Not super mobile. I think she would just go out and get the mail, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, maybe they think, okay, what if she goes into the garage? She'd find the body. Right. That would be terrible. So Dee made an appointment and took Mrs. Fisher to the beauty shop. And while she was getting her hair done, she and Alan moved Art's body with the pickup truck. So they put, um, when they got it into the metal barn, they took some four by eight pieces of wood and put it on top of the wardrobe to keep animals from getting in. Well, that's thoughtful of you. And, of course, the barn doesn't have the air conditioning, so there's going to be a quicker decomposition. And the aromas that go along with that. Yes, definitely. So Art's body is now out of the way, or at least the way they're thinking of it. And Dee could focus her attention on Mrs. Fisher. So every day at noon and 6 p.m., Dee would get an order from the pancake house and drive it to Art's property. Driving there, she's tormented by visions of Art's body being discovered. Horrific body fluids were leaking from the wardrobe, and the smell of death was recognizable as she pulled into the property. No Jeez. kidding. I can't imagine this. Yeah, I can't either. For several days, Dee saw Art's Doberman hanging around the property looking hungry, but within two weeks he had disappeared. Yeah. Poor, poor dog. I know, right? Bessie spent her days watching soap operas and game shows. She had a cat, and they both slept at least 16 hours a day. She asked about Art, but she was confused. Enough time that Dee could fool her. Bringing Bessie meals and spending time with her felt like penance, I guess in a sense. Bessie reminded Dee of her own grandmother, who had raised her until age eight. So at the IHOP, Dee had taken over as assistant manager. But she wasn't really happy. She was earning a lot less than she had as a waitress. She wasn't getting a salary at all, and Alan would just give her some money from the from the cash register when she needed it. Plus, of course, she was drinking more than ever. She kept a separate bottle of scotch in the car, at home, and at the IHOP. So she's got three going at a time. Right. Yeah. And she's going through upwards of three whole bottles a day. I just can't imagine that, but yeah. I can't either. So she's working also 12 to 16 hour shifts per day and rarely seeing her kids. So Dee's daughter Susan was 17 at this point, and she wasn't living at home, mostly to avoid her abusive stepfather, Cass. Now, we really haven't said much about him, but he was a drinker, and he would argue a lot with Dee and end up hitting her. Right. And Susan would just not tolerate that. She didn't want to be around it. So Dee began talking on the phone to Susan more often at this point, and she really wanted to confide in her, but she was resisting doing that. So Alan didn't come to the IHOP very often anymore. Dee estimated that he was taking two to $3,000 a week from the cash register. 
he rented a house out in Kendall for him and his boyfriend. And he had the house renovated. He put in new carpet, air conditioning, new appliances, even though he didn't even own the house. So Alan was also stealing from Art's E.F. Hutton account. He had um, a new deck built on the house, and he bought his boyfriend a new car. Sometimes he didn't even come to the restaurant for the cash. He would actually call Dee, and she would have the cash delivered to him by a busboy. So Alan continued trying to convince Dee also that Bessie's death would be the best thing for everybody. With Bessie dead, he said, there would be no more loose ends, and they could move on with their lives. Dee said Art's murder had been horrible enough, and she didn't want to compound it with another murder by killing Bessie. When Dee was arrested for a DUI, Alan said that the only way to reduce her stress was that they would just have to get rid of Bessie. So he'd spun it that way somehow. Whatever works. Right. So one day, after dropping off Bessie's lunch, Dee saw Mike Irvine and Bill Rhodes on Art's property. And when she told Alan... He said, well, that's it. Bessie's just going to have to die. Yeah, Alan said that loose ends needed to be tied up. Uh, he said that they would have to kill her, and he promised Dee that she would be the last one. When Dee said no, he said it wasn't really murder because she was so old. She's going to die soon anyway. That's, that's a ridiculous rationale, isn't, huh? Isn't that great reasoning? This is even better. He said we'd be doing her a favor. If we kill her, she never has to know that her son died. Right. So that's very altruistic. Very kind of him, isn't it? Isn't it? So on other fronts, corporate IHOP called to see why they weren't getting their money. I'm not sure why it took him so long, because he'd been scavenging money for quite some time. But well, yes, but, Al, but Art was still managing to pay from his own money. Okay. So now that Art's dead, nobody's bothering to pay them at all. There's no money. So D was able to put them off but the IHOP employees were getting suspicious. Since killing Art, Alan took Dee out to dinner weekly. They were becoming very close. She's completely infatuated with him, and she dressed up for these dates. Alan treated her like a queen on these outings, buying her gifts and bottles of scotch. See, he knows the way. Well, yeah, I think he knew that he needed to keep her dependent on the alcohol. That's what he had over her to begin with. Right. So he was using that, obviously. To, to D, Alan seemed like an attentive southern gentleman. Yeah. That's, that's got to be the scotch talking. <laughs> I think so. At the end of one of those dinners, Alan gave Dee a raise, and then he got her to agree to talk to Mike about killing Bessie. It's not right for her to be out there all alone, he told her. It would be best for her to be eliminated. So Dee says, oh, maybe, maybe you're right. So according to Dee, she cared about Bessie, but her, really, her actions here really don't support that. She drove to the Amico station to discuss a second murder with Mike Irvine, and Mike was agreeable with it. Dee told him that they had left a real mess with Art's murder, though, and she requested that they bury Mrs. Fisher's body after they kill her. Now, Mike gave her a price of $2,500 for killing Bessie, and this included burying her body. The payment plan was the same as it had been for Art, half up front and half later. So she goes to Alan, and Alan's pleased with that deal, and he gave Dee twelve fifty from the IHOP register for the down payment. There's the down payment. Right. Now, by this time, Art's body had been rotting in the barn for six weeks. My God. So you can only imagine the stench that's emanating from this barn. I mean, you would really have to be a sick person to be driving out there. I don't know, to be doing any of this. It's just so sick. I can't comprehend it? it. She's going out twice a day. And every time she goes out, she's smelling that horrendous aroma. Right. And still she keeps on going. She doesn't say anything. Right. It's just really sick. Sick people. So the, Alan and Dee needed to make some kind of arrangement for Art before planning Bessie's murder. So they decided, well, we'll dig a, a grave and put him in, and then we can add Bessie's body to it. Right. But beneath the topsoil, Art's property was solid coral, so there ain't no digging there. Right. At least with They shovels. weren't able to, no. So Dee called Wayne's backhoe service. 
Wayne Tidwell, who owned and operated the service, recalled his visit to Art's property. He met Dee in the front yard, and she said she needed a trash pit dug, 18 by 18 by 4 feet deep. She had a spot picked out in the southeast corner of the property. He remembered that there was a strong smell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so he noticed it. And I'm, I just, I'm not familiar with a trash pit. Is that something that people in Florida use or people? I think it's a rural thing that you can just thing? dig a big pit and throw all your junk in it. And then eventually cover it and up. And cover it, yes. That's so, my understanding of it. Yeah, I guess reading about a trash pit just. I mean, 18 by 18 by 4. Yeah, you can put a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, although it's not that deep. No. No. So the first week in August, Mike Irvine agreed to murder Bessie Fisher. They'd put her in the, the hole that Tidwell had dug. Mike told Dee that he and Bill would kill her on August 6th. Dee explained that Bessie kept her door locked, but she was going to let them in, posing as roof repairmen to fix a leak on her roof. So right now. That's the cover story. Right. Now, in Dee's interview, she claims that she asked Mike to make it painless when he killed Bessie, and that he agreed to that. Well, of course he would. Now, on August 6th, at about 5 p.m., Dee put in an order for a club sandwich, some tea, and a peach cobbler for Bessie's supper. So this is the part of the story that really gets to me, is how she just very... Uh, systematically? Nonchalantly? Yeah, the, goes through this. Yeah, knowing Setting up this woman to be, be murdered. Killed. Yeah. So she puts in the order for her food, and she delivers it to her. Now, after serving the food to Bessie on her little table, Dee told her that she was worried about the leaky roof. She didn't want her to get a cold. So she told Bessie that she'd hired some men to fix it, and told her they'll be here soon, so make sure you let them in. Now Bessie thanked Dee for thinking of her, and began to eat her supper. Now Dee didn't stay with Bessie while she ate that day, as she sometimes did. She didn't want to be there when Mike and Bill showed up. So she gave Bessie a hug and said goodbye to her. And as Dee's driving away, she saw Mike and Bill driving in, so the two cars stopped beside one another, about halfway along the driveway, and Dee looked at Mike and said nothing, and Mike gave her one of his winks. Yuck. And she continues driving, knowing that these two men are going to kill this poor old woman. Right. It's unforgivable. And, and this woman that she had kind of established a friendship and rapport with. Right. And was supposedly wanting to take care of. Yeah. Yeah. So poor Bessie, she lets Mike and Bill into her trailer and she thought they were going to fix her roof and leave, but they actually strangled her right there in her chair at the table. Now, Mike and Bill had different versions of what happened that day. Of course, Bill said that Mike asked him, set him up. He said that Mike asked him if he was interested in making some money, helping him fix a roof, and that Mike had picked him up at a little after five and drove them to the trailer. Then Bill said he recognized the property because he'd been there seven weeks earlier to rough up a guy at the house. Now, that was Art's murder. Right. That was more than roughing up. Absolutely. Now, Bill said he met Mrs. Fisher in the trailer, and he said that he saw Mike strangling her, and he ran out to the car. He didn't tell anyone because he was afraid of Mike. So then in Mike's version, Bill strangled Bessie while Mike stayed in the kitchen, and he didn't tell anyone because he was afraid of Bill. Yeah, each one's afraid of the other one. Right. And each one is innocent. So both Bill and Mike, though, they did admit to seeing Dee in the driveway. Now, the Sunday after Mrs. Fisher's murder, Mike picked up the second $1,250 from Dee at the IHOP. And Monday, Alan and Dee drove to the property to make sure that Bessie's body was well covered in the trash pit. But in the trailer, Bessie's body was still there. She was sitting at her kitchen table with her head slumped against her chest. So they didn't bury her? No. They left her right there in the chair. So Dee was relieved that there was no blood because she thought that way it was less violent or something. 
but she was really upset that the body had been left in the trailer. Also, they discovered that the men had stolen Bessie's jewelry. So, Alan and Dee covered the trailer window with a pillowcase, and they left. And Dee called Mike and told him that he needed to go back out there and bury Bessie. So then Dee went back three days later, and Bessie's body was still at the table. As you can imagine, the condition was bad. This is Florida. No right. air conditioning. No air conditioning in this little trailer. Yeah. Must have been flies. So and, there's oh. a bloated, decomposing corpse. Yeah. And... uh so she drives back to the Amico station. But Mike wasn't there, but Bill was. So Dee says, you were supposed to put Mrs. Fisher in the ground. Bill glared at her, according to Dee, and said, I don't plan them, I only kill them. Wow. On the next morning, the 10th of August, Dee returned to the trailer and the body was gone. It was in the pit. Dee rented a bulldozer and forklift the next day. She and Alan went to the property and used the forklift to put the wardrobe in the pit. Then Alan tried to plow back the dirt and rocks into the pit, but the bulldozer wasn't powerful enough to move the slabs of coral. So instead, Dee and Alan grabbed an old mattress from the barn, tossed it over the wardrobe. Then they poured whatever trash they could find into the pit until the bodies were well concealed. Uh-huh. Then Dee called Wayne Tisdale again. She told him that she was renting the house to a family with children, and she was concerned about the small children falling into the pit. So Tidwell returned and covered the pit. So then the IHOP employees noticed that Dee was no longer taking meals to Bessie. So Alan told the employees that Bessie had moved to North Carolina to be with Art. Then Alan hitched her trailer to the Lincoln and drove it to his house in Kendall. Now, during all this, Alan's living a pretty extravagant lifestyle. Pretty extravagant? I'd say very. He's spending the money like crazy. Yeah, with no thought to when it runs out. No. So by the end of July, he'd gone through over $30,000 from Art's E.F. Hutton account. In addition, there were several dividend checks sent to Art's house. Alan forged signatures on the checks and cashed them. His other income was the 3000 a week he was taking from the IHOP register. Right, so he's not even working. No, he's just living off the fat of the land. Right. Now, suppliers revoked credit at the IHOP, and Dee could only buy what was needed with cash at that point. The franchise was way behind on its payments to the management system's main office for the IHOP in Florida. So IHOP officials called over and over to discuss discrepancies with Art Venetia. Dee told them that he was in North Carolina on business, and then she was getting really worried, and she begged Alan to please curb his spending and pay the main office. But Alan really wasn't concerned. So despite the stress, Dee was becoming closer than ever with Alan. She was openly in love with him at this point. She even told her friends and her daughter Susan that she loved him and she fantasized about making love with him. Now, even though her daughter would yell at her, he's using you, you're crazy. She just persisted in this fantasy world. She's convinced. Yes. That this gay guy is going to be in love with her. Right. 20 years younger, homosexual, psychopath? I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. So Dee confided to her daughter about the murders eventually, like a little bit at a time. She would just kind of expose a little bit, like first... They were already dead, I think, and she told her daughter, oh, Alan wants to kill Art, to try and kind of break her into it, but ended up anyway confiding the whole thing to her daughter when she was drunk at night calling her. Now Dee got behind on her house payments, so instead of giving her money, Alan told her to move into Art's house. So in September, so that's like a month after Bessie Fisher had been killed, Dee moved into the house where the bodies were buried with her two boys. Yeah, that, that's another one that I just can't quite get my head around. This whole story is insanity. Isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So she moves into Art's house. Yeah. Now Susan, she's really angry, and she's shocked with Dee's part in the murders, of course. She's calling her mother insane, heartless, and hopeless. And she even threatened to go to the police. 
but, you know, she had these little brothers, and she did love her mother, so she decided to support her. Now, Susan claimed that Bessie's murder devastated Dee. Dee was drinking, you know, at least three bottles of scotch a day, like you said, and at night she would talk about Bessie, and she'd cry and cry. So Susan moved into the Venezia house to help her mother and her younger brothers. Now, Dee had already separated from her husband, Cass, and filed for divorce, and he'd moved out of state. Now, eventually there were no more stocks to liquidate, so Alan decided to sell Bessie's trailer for some cash. For some reason, like like for all the things she's done before, she decides that she'll run the ad for him, or he decides that she'll run the ad, and she agrees. Right. And she meets with the buyer, and she completes the sale. So she's the one, her face is on all this. Mm -hmm. And Alan gets $4,000 for the trailer, and he gives D $300. Very generous of him. So what's that, 8%? 8% uh, yeah, it's, commission? Well, it's certainly less than 10. Yes, right. So in October, and this was three months before the pancake house got taken from them, Alan and Dee decided to refinance Art's house. Dee acted as the broker for Art, and Alan posed as Art. Yeah, they really and got away with it a lot now. Remarkably. It was the 70s, so I guess it was easier to get away with some of this stuff, but... Yeah. Well, actually, it was the 1980s, not the 1970s. But still, makes a difference, I think. But still, remarkably, the mortgage broker accepted Alan as Art Venetia without asking for proper ID. Right. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it was probably just a matter of, oh, we're going to make some money out of this. Yeah, yeah. Alan and Dee then sold Art's yacht. Alan became a notary public so that he could notarize documents giving Dee the power of attorney for Art Venetia. So that's really bold. Isn't it? There seems to be no fear of getting caught here. They went to a stationery store and picked up power of attorney forms. Alan forged Art's signature, signature on the power of attorney form and notarized it. They got $36,000 for the yacht. The closing was in February 1984. After that, they sold Art's organ that he had been working on for $14,000. The Lincoln Town Car got repossessed. Yeah, I'm sure they would have sold it otherwise. Then they sold the biggest item, which was Art's house, and the five acres in the Redlands. Yeah, so there was actually a landscaper that was interested in the house. And the house had gotten kind of run down. It was dirty, and things were in disrepair. The land was a tangle of weeds and overgrown trees, so the lot needed a lot of work to be cleared for his business. So this landscaper he met several times with a young man who said he was Art Venencia. And the price for the property and house was a real bargain at $150,000. So this was attractive to him, but it was also a real red flag when something's that cheap. Yeah, but he still ignored the red flag. Yeah. Well, Alan had told him that his grandmother was gravely ill in another state and that he was anxious to make the sale and move out to be with her. So the sale went through and the closing was in March 1984. Now, when all of the debts and the old mortgage were paid off from the $150,000, all that Alan was left with was $15,000. Yeah, he'll blow through that pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, he gave Dee 3500 because she had to move out of the house, of course, and have another house for her and her kids. Right. So she got a small rental house in Homestead, Florida. So by the end of March 1984, Dee was really hitting rock bottom. She finally realized that Alan didn't love her, so good for you. Well, there's, there's some insight, huh? <laughs> yeah. And Susan, unfortunately, was becoming a heavy drinker and was using cocaine. And now, of course, Dee's unemployed because the pancake house was taken away. So that, her supposed worst nightmare and fear of losing her job has happened. So despite doing all this, she hasn't. Improved life for anyone, really. Not in the least. Maybe temporarily Alan. So Dee called an old friend, Jackie Reagan, that spring and started spending some time with her. And Jackie took Dee out for drinks during the daytime. 
and while they were out, Dee became really weepy and drunk. So Jackie brought her home and put her to bed and stayed at the house so she'd be there when the boys got home from school. And at 7 p.m., Dee woke up. So the boys weren't home at that point, so it was just Dee and Susan was there and Jackie was there. And Dee told Susan that she wanted her to write down whatever she said, and this is when Dee revealed all of the details of the murders. So Jackie was overhearing all this, and she began to cry, you know, not understanding why she was saying that. She didn't really believe it was true at first. She's shocked. This was an old friend of hers. Who's confessing to her role in two killings. Right, exactly. I'm wondering what made her want to confess. You think it was just to the point that she'd had enough? Yeah, but I also think she was afraid that Alan was going to kill her. Yeah. Yep. And she. That's true. Yeah. Because she knows too much. Right. And she did say that having Susan write it down was life insurance so that Alan wouldn't murder her. Okay. Yeah. So in August, some friends of Art had become concerned because they hadn't heard from him. And his accountant called the IHOP looking for him several times. In October, two friends from the Organ Society were driving through the Redlands one day, and they decided to drop in on Art. But they met Dee instead, who explained that she was taking care of the house while Art was away. But they found the condition of the greenhouses and the grounds very disturbing, because that's just not the way that Art had kept things. The condition of the plants was really shocking to them, because Art had been an expert on orchids, and a really fastidious gardener. Still, the murders went undetected, though. So it was at a Valentine's dinner in February 1984 when a woman who used to work for Art at the IHOP became really suspicious. She called a representative of the North Carolina Motel and Restaurant Association, and they had not heard of Art, who'd supposedly been down there for months and months buying a restaurant and a motel. According to Alan. According to Alan. Right. But they hadn't even heard of him. So the, the woman who's uh, going by the name of Anne went to Art's property in February. She walked around the house noticing the terrible condition of the grounds. She found an overdue bill for a large amount of money uh, that was an electric bill. This made no sense because Art always paid his bills. So she calls the local police. Yeah, and I think she had to call them more than once. She kept bothering them because they weren't, I don't want to say not taking it seriously, but they didn't have any good evidence that a crime had occurred. Right. So the next month in March, Jackie Reagan told Anne about Dee's confession. Anne called the police back and told them everything. So finally, after several days, the police went to the Venetia property, who is now, which is now owned by the landscaper. Right, yeah. Anne told the officer that Art's body had been stored in the barn. He went there and saw stains from fluids that could have been bodily fluids. That's disgusting. Isn't it? Anne had already taken detectives by Dee's house where they saw the red pickup. When they ran the plate, they found that it was registered to Art. Yeah, so she just takes this truck and... Yeah. (laughs) Then the detectives went to Wayne Tidwell's backhoe service and asked him if he remembered doing any digging at the Venetia address. Uh, he certainly did. Of course he did. So mid-April, the landscaper was cutting trees on the Redlands property when two detectives in suits and ties approached him. They showed him a picture of Art, asking if this was the man who had sold him the property. Well, of course it wasn't Art. No, it was Alan. It was Alan. Police began digging at the site of the trash pit that afternoon. By 5 p.m., they had found the bodies of Art Venetia and Bessie Fisher. Right. Jig is up. Yep. Dee and Alan were picked up by the police. Although Dee was nervous, she didn't understand why she was arrested for murder. Because in her mind, she hadn't killed anyone. Right. So they're going to question her, and she's going to get to go home. Well, that's like back when she worked at the light company. She was just borrowing. She wasn't stealing. Right. So here she's like, well, I didn't murder anybody. Yeah. Although she played such a big role in it. One could even say she was the mastermind. Although, Alan was probably the mastermind, but Dee was the one who did all the setting up. Yeah, I mean, it was our, it was Alan's idea, but Dee did do most of the setting up, paid them. 
yeah. made plans. And then afterwards, she did so much of the financial stuff because right. she was pretty good at that kind of stuff. She was, and she was so actively participating in the cover-up. Right. Yeah, exactly. So once she was confronted with the evidence, she told the detectives everything. Now, Bill Rhodes, he pointed the finger at Mike Irvine, and Mike pointed the finger at Bill. When Alan was picked up, he told the story of two guys forcing him at knife point to watch as they killed Art. And then they threatened to kill him if he said anything to the police. Sure. So that's a likely story, that's huh? That's my story. Right. So it took three years for them to go to trial. And Alan was the only one who didn't testify. All four were found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder. Dee and Alan were also convicted of grand theft, because they'd done quite a bit of that. They had. In the penalty phase, witnesses were brought in to speak to the characters of the defendants. And Mike, Bill, and Dee had quite a few people that said good things about them. Alan only had, I think, one or two people that showed up. Because even people that had liked Alan knew that he was just a liar and a sociopath. Yes. Yep. So all of them did receive the death penalty. And then years later... I think it was in the late 90s that they were, the sentences were overturned and they got life in prison. All of them. All of them. So they got their sentences reduced from death by electrocution to life in prison. I think it was lethal injection. No, they're talking about old Sparky. Oh, that's true. Electric chair. Yeah. And Dee died, so... He died in prison? Yeah. Now, with the interview that she had, that we read, it seemed like she was almost better off in prison because she couldn't drink. She couldn't drink. And her head was finally a little bit clearer. And she turned out to be a pretty model prisoner. She did. She helped others. Yep. And again, no one's disputing her intelligence. No, but... She did some horrible things. Oh, she totally wrecked her life. Yeah, and other people's, not just hers. Think about her kids and the people that were murdered, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's just such a twisted, turning story. I just can't get over it. It's a depressing story, isn't it? It's depressing, yeah. It is. Depressing in the fact of what's the most depressing part? I mean, of course a murder is depressing. But what do you mean? Well, it's depressing to me because I have this woman who, by all accounts, was an intelligent person who could have done something with her life. I see, yeah. And alcohol wrecked her. And uh, she didn't think clearly. It was more than that, though, I think. Well, yeah, there's something more than that. But, yeah. I mean, she she could have been way better than she turned out to be. Exactly. So that's yeah. what's depressing. Right. A wasted life. Yep, it sure is. But definitely an interesting tale. Very interesting tale. Yeah. And you were telling me about it, and I'm reading about it, and I'm thinking, I can't believe what I'm reading. I know. It's, it just goes to the, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to make sure we thank Gary Provost for his book, Without Mercy, Obsession and Murder Under the Influence. Gary interviewed D. Much of this podcast was based on Gary's interview with D. Really a fascinating story and a great read if you want to find out more about the case and get more details. It's a great read, Without Mercy, Obsession, and Murder Under the Influence by Gary Provost. So thanks, Gary. How about a little self-promotion before feedback? I'm always good at self-promotion. Well, here at Tiger River Podcasts, we have a members-only True Crime Brewery podcast feed for members of our team, Team Tie Grabber. If you'd like to hear more of TCB and support the podcast, you can join Team Tie Grabber at tiegrabber.com. The cost for this has three levels, $2 a month, $3 a month, or $5 a month, depending on how much you'd like to get. For $2 a month, you get a nice True Crime Brewery sticker. For $3, we're going to send you our wallet-sized, credit card-sized bottle opener which is really cool. And one of the benefits of going for the $5 a month contribution is that you're going to get a wonderful True Crime Brewery snifter exactly like the ones that Dick uses on our show. The best glass to drink beer from. That's right. 
But any way you do it, we really appreciate any kind of support that you give us. We absolutely do. Now, some other ways to help True Crime Brewery include leaving us a five-star review on iTunes or shopping our merch on our website, tagrabber.com, and following us on social media. We're on Instagram and Twitter at TigerBarPods. We also have a Facebook page. Also, I'm so excited to announce that our avid listener, Shauna Foy, has created a Facebook group, True Crime Brewery Fan Discussions. Now, this is a group where TCB listeners can discuss cases we've covered and cases we should cover in the future. Maybe some cases that we shouldn't do as well. I don't know. You never know. So thanks, Shauna. Anybody who's interested, go ahead and check it out and join the group. I'm definitely going to be active in it. So whatever you want to write there, I will be happy to read it and interact. You know, our listeners give us the best recommendations and feedback. So we definitely want to hear what you have to say. We sure do. Yep. Okay. Are you ready for some feedback? I've got great feedback today. I'm ready. All right. We'll do feedback after the music. Welcome to Feedback. Okay, this week you lead off. Okay, so I'm going to start with a Facebook message from Laura. Hello, Jill. I'm listening to your excellent Jody Arias episode. You and Dick were discussing that the murder of Travis was premeditated, yet she had sex with him beforehand. It is my understanding that Travis was going on a work trip that was at a beach resort, and Jody was furious that he wasn't taking her with him. That's true. He was taking that other girl. We thought he had originally invited Jody. Yeah. And, and then rescinded her invitation. Which would really or, piss her off. Or rescinded his invitation to her. Right. So Laura continues. I think she went there and tried to get back with him, seduce him, and have him take her on that trip. I think she premeditated that if he would not take her on that trip, she was going to kill him. He didn't change his mind despite her seduction attempt, so she brutally killed him. I find her utterly terrifying. She has shark eyes, a truly remorseless psychopath. Poor Travis. I also really enjoyed the feedback portion on your most recent episode where Dick discussed the veracity of Susan Smith's confession based on the analysis and language used. I just cannot get enough of the psychology behind people who commit heinous crimes like these. I find it fascinating. We do too. Definitely. And a lot of that... uh analysis of the Susan Smith confession, I just flat out didn't understand how they <laughs> arrived at those conclusions. Some of it, yeah. But some of it made pretty common yeah, sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So what about this Jody Arias thing though? That's I think she's got the right idea here. Maybe yeah. if he'd said I'm gonna I love you and I'm taking you on the trip, then everything would have been fine. That's true. We didn't think of that. I mean we looked at it as or I looked at it, maybe you didn't she arrived there with the intent of killing him. Right. And uh, maybe they had one last roll around before the killing. But I think this is a plausible thing, that she went there with the intention of seducing him into him taking her on the trip. That makes more sense. I think more than just the trip, though. I think she wanted him to be in love with her. Yeah. Yeah, and really want to be yeah, with so her I, long term. I like her line of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you, Laura. What have you got? I have an email from Chris. I've been meaning to email you guys for quite some time to let you know how much I enjoy your podcast. The way you interact and the perspective each of you bring to you the stories always holds my attention, even if I am very familiar with the case. Chris goes on to say, I wanted to request a case. It is one I have never heard a podcaster do, and I think it is one that needs to be told. As an adoptive mother, this type of story really breaks my heart. So you did a little quick research, and this is the story of Georgia Tan, T-A-N-N, who is a wealthy and politically connected person in Memphis. She made a fortune selling children kidnapped from poor women. Wow. It's amazing. That gets me right there. In a bad way, yeah. And she was executive director of the Memphis branch of the Tennessee Children's Home Society. Turns out that many children died in their custody, and it made Memphis's infant mortality rate the highest in the country. So, so you weren't aware of this? I'm already interested in this. we got to check into it. You haven't heard about it? No. Okay. Yeah, I thought it would be something different to do. I think I'd like to do it. Oh, absolutely. Plus, it also has the children and the mortality rate, which I think you could probably share a lot of expertise with us on that. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what the uh, deaths were due to. Yeah, exactly. Or, or what they claim the deaths were due to. So right. So that'd be an excellent thing to look up. I think so. So, Chris, I think we're going to do this. Yeah. Jill might waffle a little bit, but I'm going for it. <laughs> Why talk, would I waffle? I'll talk her into it. Why do you think I'd waffle? Well, half of these ones you say, oh, we'll think about it, and that's it. Well, it's not It's not it. I have a whole drawer where I file it away. Okay. Never <laughs> I just mind. haven't gotten to some of them. So we're going to get to this one. I think we'll definitely get and, to that and one. we're going to get to this one sooner rather than later. Oh, is that a request? That's a request. Okay. Good. All right, Chris. So your request has been seconded. Is that a word? Seconded. Made and seconded. It's made and seconded. Okay. So I have another Facebook message from Arik, and it is, I have a suggested true crime for you. His name is Joseph Duncan from Idaho. If I remember correctly, he was somewhat a friend of the family until he killed them and abducted their children. Just thought it might spark your interest. Well, there's another one that sounds interesting. Have you ever heard of this one? No, ma'am. Okay, so I looked into it, you know, just a little bit. And so Joseph Duncan was a guy with a history of sexual assault, and he was violent. And in 2005, he killed two parents and their 13-year-old son, and then he abducted the two younger kids, a boy and a girl, who were eight and nine. Now, he ended up killing the boy of the two that he abducted, and the girl survived. Huh. Yeah, so... Uh, that sounds interesting, too. It does. Now, he's kind of a serial killer because there were some other um, killings. Besides his family? Yeah. And I know we've had quite a few people write in and they want us to do more of the individual crimes and not the serial killers. But I think there's a place for serial killers in our show. Well, certainly. Yeah. Maybe not every month, but maybe every couple months we'll throw a serial killer in. Well, we won't make promises. No. So I have another Facebook message from Ronnie, and Ronnie says, I know you guys are extremely busy, but if you could look into covering Fred and Rose West in their House of Horrors, I would absolutely love Dick's professional opinion on the minds of madness that were that pair. The things they did to their own children and so many women is just unthinkable. Also, how many years they were able to get away with it as well. Anyways, just a suggestion. I know you probably get a hundred a day. Well, we don't get a hundred a day. I would no. be pulling my hair out. We'd, we'd be going crazy if <laughs> yeah. we had a hundred a day. Yeah, but we do get several but a day. We get a lot. Yeah, and and everyone I've heard tonight sounds like a really interesting story. That's the thing, though. There are so many interesting ones. Yeah, so it's I think hard to pick. We have enough material to keep us going for a while. Yeah, I think we might want to do is like take three cases. And then put it out there to listeners to vote. Maybe have a contest for pick the episode you want us to do on a certain date. And people could vote for the one out of three. Well, that's an idea. And let them make the choice. Okay. We should do that sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, you love contests. We haven't had one in a long time. Oh, and that might be a good way to do it. Break back into the contest thing. Yeah, but nobody would get a prize for that. 
No. It would just be a matter of. But it would the prize would be you get to listen to the case you the want. The case you want the most. Okay, that's true. So anyway, this uh, Fred and Rose West. I had looked into them actually. I think I'd gotten a suggestion about them before, so I did have a file on them, and I looked at it again yesterday. They're an English couple, and they were responsible for killing at least twelve young women. And I think actually he killed Fred killed Rose's daughter, and Rose killed one of Fred's kids or something too. Oh, how lovely! Yeah, so these were a really sick pair, and they did get away with it for many years. So. Um, yeah, like you said, these both, all three of the suggestions here have been good. Oh, definitely. So that's definitely going to be filed in my to-do list. Okay. So we'll, next. We'll have to see which ones get into the final three. Because I'm already <laughs> taking Chris's suggestion about the uh, adoption agency woman. Well, that, that doesn't have to be part of the contest. We can just do that one. That's not going to be part of the contest. That's no. going to be done. I think we'll pick three that we're not completely sure if we want to do them. Yeah. You know, that we're like on the fence about. And Put the three one. out there and then have listeners pick which one they want us to do. Good choice. Okay. Because sometimes people say they want something and it's not really what they want, right? Have you noticed that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes people don't really know what they want. But I think our listeners are sharp enough that they know. They do. They know what they want. Okay. So next I'm going to play a voicemail we got which really doesn't have much to discuss about. It's kind of complimentary, but when people send in a voicemail, I like to play it as long as it's, you know, not terrible, <laughs> as long <laughs> well, as it's not abusive to you, anyone. you got to play a voice message because yeah. we don't get too many of them. No. And so, we want more, so send us voice messages. We do like voice messages, and we do play them. So let's play this voice message. Okay. All right. You guys are so adorable. I've been listening to you guys for a few weeks now while at work, and it's been so enjoyable. I, too, and my husband, too, both love true crime, but you guys really do an excellent job of having to use my imagination while listening to you versus just watching something on TV. I actually have to pay attention, which is a difficult thing for me at times, so I appreciate that. Um just want to say thank you for making an awesome podcast, and you guys do a great job. And um, I also want to say on Dick's beer information, outstanding. My husband is a home brewer, and so I, I get to share with him some of your expertise in your beer, and hopefully that will help him make some awesome beers in the future. Thanks again. Well, thank you, Danny Denise. It's those kinds of voicemails and emails that make me want to keep doing this because sometimes you feel like, oh, it's a lot of work, and then people give you nice compliments like this, and it re-energizes me to do more podcasts. Well, I, I would just have a couple comments Okay. to this. The first is kind of uh, superficial, but I just love being called adorable. You do? Yes. Yeah. I call you that sometimes. You do. Yeah, because you are really cute, especially <laughs> in your bow tie. The, the infrequent bow tie. <laughs> but the other thing, and she's talking about her husband who's the home brewer. Yeah. And, and I'm just in awe of people that brew their own beer. Really? It's a uh, lot of work? I've tried that. Have you? It's a ton of work. I don't remember the, you doing it, but okay. It was before you. Oh, okay. Or what's that song? Was there it's anything before me? It's a Jimmy Buffett me? song, pre-you. Okay. <laughs> anyway. I, I did that many years ago. It was very labor-intensive, and the beer I made tasted like shit, except there was a stout I made that wasn't half bad. But I, I think home brewers that can make a, a fine beer are just exquisitely talented. talented. Yeah. Yep. All right. And if they listen to podcasts, too, they must be really cool people. Well, yeah, because yeah. they like to brew beer, and they like true crimes. That's so right. There they are. Yeah. So this is turning out to be a bit of a marathon of a podcast, but I have one more thing I just wanted to add Okay. from YouTube. Let's finish up. Yeah. I received a video link on YouTube from Charles Baker, and this was in relation to the Girl Scout murders, an episode we did, I think, four or six weeks ago. And it seems to be a neighbor who thinks that his son... And some of his friends may have had something to do with the murders. And he also believes that maybe his son was killed to keep him quiet. 
So this is interesting. I've had at least 10 people mention this to me. So I'm going to play it just so we can hear it and everybody can hear what I'm talking about. And then maybe Dick, you and I can just talk about it a little bit as part of feedback and discuss if it's something we want to follow up with maybe. Let's just listen and then we can chat about it. Okay. 18-year-old Jimmy Bryan was murdered in early July of 1977 in Cherokee County, shortly after the Girl Scout murders had occurred in June of that same year in Mays County. Jimmy's body was not found until August 4th, almost a month after he was killed. It was alleged that marijuana was the reason for the murder. A suspect was arrested, pleaded no contest, and is now serving life in prison. But Jimmy's father, Travis, began to hear stories that the group of young men had bragged about the Girl Scout murders, and he believes Jimmy was killed to keep him quiet about what he knew. The boy stayed all night at my house probably four three or four nights prior to the murder up there at Locust Grove. And the type of shoes that he had on, he sat right here and we sat here and drank coffee and I made the remark to my wife after the boys left about his funny looking shoes he had on. It looked like that the soles were car tires. And then one night on the newscast, well, I saw when they brought out about the footprints in the cave up there. Well, I brought it to my wife's attention about it. And, uh, then there was a picture the next night shown on television, and my youngest son said he knew the girl. And then the next thing I knew, we heard that they were bragging about it down here, and that's when we went to the authorities. But we never could get nothing done about it. They, the boys lived in the woods practically all their life, you know. They lived in caves and old cars, bodies and things like that. And Travis Bryan believes the circumstances should be thoroughly investigated, even if his son is somehow implicated. I've got no proof of this, and I could not get any help before to try to bring this to light. Through the authorities, it was it was hushed down here on this end and hushed up there. And so, but for the benefit of the parents of the little girls up there is why I'm trying to get it done. Because, like I said, there's nothing there's nothing that can hurt me or hurt Jimmy out of this thing. And if he was implicated in it, then, you know, it's just, that's just the way it is. I believe that it was their stuff in that cave. It was, it was their uh, belongings that was found in that cave on account of the one picture, you know, that was shown in there. And the tracks, and like I said, I've got no proof. But in, in my own mind, I know that's what happened. And in my mind, I know that's why Jimmy was killed. But it's been since, since 19... 77 that we've been then you're the first one i could get to even listen to me about you know well we've we've said at the time when we did the podcast that we believe that there were accomplices in this murder these murders well it seemed like it was done by more than one person for sure yeah right because it, it was just too unlikely that one single person could do everything that was uh that was done yeah, but what's the likelihood that these teenagers would be accomplices to the escaped prisoner? Right. And and the fact that there were footprints in a cave. Right. But not at the scene of the crime. Well, there was that bloody footprint in the tent. Yeah, but it apparently didn't match any of those shoes, right? Didn't match didn't match the footprints found in the cave. Right. Yeah, that's true. So so you've got footprints in a cave where the prime suspect was known to have been hiding. So maybe maybe the, the implication is that these teenagers knew him. Maybe. Or that they were just in the same cave at separate times and, and didn't know each other. But if, if you go back to thinking that there was people that helped in the, the murders and they found footprints in the cave, then maybe it's more plausible. I suppose so. But then what is the likelihood that they would have killed his son, too, to keep him quiet? That's what this guy was saying, that he thinks right. his son was killed, which I think, by the way, it's interesting that he's willing to throw his son under the bus, don't you? Well, he's dead, so... So? So he can do that. That's not normal, though, really. Well, didn't say you think you'd want to, like maintain a good memory if you could but um 
Yeah, I could, I could also see if, if the kid was involved, the perpetrator would want to make sure that there were no loose ends and he would be killed. But why would he kill one of the kids and not the other ones? Good question. Yeah. So I guess what we're going to come down to is that there's some circumstantial stuff that might tie this murdered teenager into the Girl Scout murders. Right, right. But nothing real conclusive. No. Well, I'll look into it more and see if I can find more, but it's an older case, so it's hard to find any new information on it, really. Yeah, because it's pretty much closed. Well, yeah. But even this interview done with the father was in the 90s. So even that's over 20 years old. Right. So, But sometimes I like the older cases because uh, it's interesting, and it's interesting to see the societal differences and how those affect things. Oh, like, absolutely. As with D, how things were so different in the 50s and how that may have changed the course of her life to make things turn out differently right. than if she had been, you know, a contemporary. You're right. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think that we need to do another episode on this, definitely, but I would like to find out a little more. Yeah, let's check into it. And then I can always just talk about it during the feedback section or if any of our listeners know anything else about it and want to share. We would love to hear from you. Especially in a voicemail, right? Yes. That would be fabulous. Okay. Okay. All right. So I guess we're going to wrap it up. Let's say goodnight. I just wanted to remind people about our uh, members-only podcast that we have. We're on Verdict Watch right now. And by the time this podcast is actually released, we should have a verdict on the Bella Bond murder trial in Boston. Right. So we'll be doing that one. Yeah. As soon as we have the verdict, I've got all my notes and everything ready to go up until the, it went to the jury the other day. So as soon as that's out, I should have the podcast out within a couple days. If you're not already a member of Team Tie Grabber, now's a great time to join. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone, for listening, and we're going to wrap up this marathon of a podcast today. It's a long one. It is, but a good one. I think so. I think it'll be good. Okay. Good night. See you at the quiet end. All right.